So now we'll move on to specific drug categories, and the first of those is antibiotics. So under the green check mark, we'll have drugs that are most likely safe in neonates. Under the red symbol, we'll have those that should be avoided. And then in the middle, we have this yellow wishy-washy face, and there we'll have everything else where we don't have a strong contraindication or strong evidence of safety and efficacy in neonates. And you might guess that this category is going to contain a lot of drugs. So for antibiotics, under the, the green check mark for younger animals, we have penicillins and cephalosporins. These have a wide safety margin, and overall there's a lot of experience with them in younger animals and in pregnant animals with not a lot of documentation of adverse effects. Under the red symbol, we have oral fluoroquinolones in juveniles, um, ideally avoided for two reasons. One is the cartilage lesions that they can cause in young animals, and another is that adequate plasma concentrations might not be achieved if the animal is nursing because of chelation by calcium. Chloramphenicol can cause severe bone marrow suppression in neonates, and then tetracyclines can discolor the teeth during the developmental stage of the tooth bud. And that may also be true of drugs more water or more lipid soluble tetracyclines like doxycycline. There have been reports of these causing dental discoloration as well, but it's not as common as with the more water soluble tetracyclines. So that's why they're in the middle category. Um, aminoglycosides are more likely to cause toxicity in younger animals just because they tend to be more prone to dehydration and they have immature renal function. And so can be used if they're very well hydrated. Metronidazole might cross the blood-brain barrier in neonates more easily. And then sulfas and lincosamides and macrolides we have on here because they undergo enterohepatic recirculation and might have prolonged half-lives in the context of immature hepatic metabolism. So this slide has a little more detail about fluoroquinolone-induced arthropathy. This picture is a cartilage bulla induced by administration of enrofloxacin to a beagle, a young beagle. This seems to be a, a concentration-dependent problem, although it can happen even at the concentrations that are listed on the label for dogs. Um, and then it does seem that weight bearing makes the lesions worse. Um, this has not been reported in kittens, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, so this is some information from Bayer, who makes brand name endrofoxus and Baytrol. You can see that about eight weeks was the youngest that histopathological lesions were noted, and they happened even at five mg per kg of endrofoxacin for a month. And clinical signs were also noted at higher dosages after a short period of time. The lack of lesions in these younger puppies might be due to diminished absorption with oral drug, um, depending on what they were, what their diet consisted of at that time, or the fact that the younger animals weren't weight-bearing, and so the lesions weren't as notable. Here are some studies from kittens, but no studies in older cats. And again, it's possible that the lack of adverse effects in the kittens were because of diminished oral absorption based on that pharmacokinetic study we looked at earlier. So these are some examples of dental staining with tetracyclines. Again, less likely to happen with the more lipid-soluble tetracyclines, but not impossible. And some sources recommend not using tetracyclines until a pet is over six months old. But most of the hard tissue formation of the permanent teeth occurs by about eight weeks old. So it's before that that abnormalities tend to be the most severe. And it is permanent, but it luckily is mostly a cosmetic problem. So these are some suggestions, given what we've discussed about antibiotics, that might be helpful for antibiotics to use for neonatal sepsis. Um, as mentioned, beta-lactams tend to be the safest, and we can use some of the later generations to get gram-negative coverage, so things like cefoxetine or cefotaxime. But there might be scenarios in which alternatives for gram-negative coverage might be needed. And this is overall the reason that fluoroquinolones went under the middle yellow symbol instead of being completely contraindicated in young animals. But septic neonates, puppies with parvo or pneumonia might be treated with fluoroquinolones or aminoglycosides, depending on which is thought to pose the lesser risk to that particular puppy. Um, if a puppy is older than eight weeks old, but it's still pediatric and is destined to be a performance animal or a show animal, then avoiding fluoroquinolones might be more important um, as opposed to avoiding the renal potential renal issues with aminoglycosides. And clients should be informed of the potential risks and and 
involved in the decision if it is a situation where joint lesions might be clinically significant for that pet. Here we have two scenarios, one of a six week old dog with fish hook in his tongue. This is similar to a case that I saw uh, in general practice, except it was a husky that had gotten into a tackle box. And then one of a two week old kitten with a fractured tibia. So what were our options for sedation and analgesia in the first case and for analgesia, safe analgesia in the second? Well, for analgesics and sedatives in the green column, we have opioids and benzodiazepines. Generally, wide safety margin in neonates with appropriate titration of the dose. Um, in the red category, we have non-steroidals. In especially less than two-week-old animals, but also to be used with caution in less than six-week-old animals. The reason for this is that COX-2 is necessary for renal development because this is still renal development, as we talked about, is still going on for at least two weeks after birth in dogs. It's best to avoid NSAIDs and neonates and, and probably, again, in the, the infant period. NSAIDs have been associated with fetal nef nephrotoxicity in other species because of the fact that they interfere with COX-2. So acepromazine and the alpha-2 agonists are in this category because they can cause vasodilation and hypotension. And neonates don't compensate well for that because of their immature sympathetic nervous systems. Acepromazine also has hepatic metabolism and a long half-life, and it might be more slowly eliminated in very young animals. So you might end up with more sedation or longer lasting sedation than would be desirable. And then in the middle category, we have ketamine, which can cause respiratory depression in neonates. And then acepromazine and alpha-2 agonists in pediatrics, probably they are better able to compensate for the effects of these drugs than neonates are, um, but still required some caution and close monitoring when using these drugs in this age group. So as we mentioned, opioids are the analgesic of choice in the very young. Um, neonates seem to clinically require less and so the recommendation is to reduce the dose by 50% if the drug is being used for pre-med and by 30% if it's being used for analgesia. And then by about two weeks old, it's possible to start at the low end of the adult dose and then just titrate to effect. These, this chart here shows minimal approval ages for various non-steroidals, and you'll notice none of them are less than six weeks old. The one that has the oldest recommend, age for recommended use is furacoxid. As we talked about earlier, this can be because it either hasn't been tested in young dogs or because it caused adverse effects. And we can look at the label to find out. And it turns out that in the case of ferrocoxib, it was because of adverse effects. So some fairly significant issues in the groups that got higher dosages. A little more detail about acepromazine and alpha-2 agonists in pediatrics. Um, as we discussed, acepromazine of the hepatic metabolism and long half-life may take longer to be eliminated in younger animals. So if it's given, then the dose should be reduced, and ideally it wouldn't be given to dogs that are less than 12 weeks old. The latter is also true for dexmedetomidine and other alpha-2s if other options are available, just to avoid interference with essential physiologic responses for increasing cardiac output in very young patients. That being said, going back to the two scenarios we mentioned earlier, the combination of an opioid and midazolam did not sedate that husky puppy even slightly. And in the end, we had to sedate him with dexmedetomidine and then quickly remove the fish hook and then just reverse the dexmedetomidine. The opioid in his system was probably still providing him some analgesia, but he was being a husky way too wiggly to do the procedure with just that alone. Uh, for the kitten, a full mu agonist opioid would be a good choice for pain relief. And that could be started at the low end of the adult dose or that dose reduced by about 30% and then titrated to effect. So moving on to emergency drugs and neonatal resuscitation. In the green category, we have epinephrine, which is commonly used and appears to be safe um, for resuscitation in young animals. Atropine, although it will increase the heart rate, does increase myocardial oxygen demand. Um, so in some sources, it's listed as contraindicated in neonates and pediatric animals up to a certain age. Doxapram is in the middle column just because although it used to be used commonly in neonates delivered by C-sections, improved survival after resuscitation with doxapram has not been demonstrated. If we look at anticonvulsants, potassium bromide has been used in young animals with no apparent adverse effects. 
you know, barbitol relies heavily on hepatic metabolism, so lower doses are advised in younger animals. And here we have GI drugs. Um, in the middle category, we have H2 blockers in neonates, again, because they already have a close to neutral gastric pH, so proton and pump inhibitors could go in this category as well. Metoclopramide has been theorized not to work in neonates because of the in immature innervation of the GI tract. It's probably fine for infant and pediatric animals, for example, parvo puppies, because it's been used quite frequently in those animals over a period of years. It doesn't seem to be problematic from anything that's clinically perceptible. Um, and then it's unknown whether sucralfate has adverse effects in neonates. Serenia, or meropotent, is labeled only for puppies eight weeks or older, and we'll look at why. So in this first study, that was, it was originally labeled for puppies that were four months of age and older because it was tested in puppies under 11 weeks and found to cause bone marrow hypocellularity more frequently. But if you look into this in a little more detail, a lot of the puppies in those studies were weaned early and or they had comorbidities, so coccidia or parvovirus. So the manufacturer ultimately repeated the study and submitted a su supplemental application for dogs, use of dogs eight weeks of age and older. And bone marrow hypocellularity was only seen in one dog in the second study, and the clinical significance was unclear. But because it was thought to be a dose-dependent side effect, then the minimal recommended age for the higher dose, the motion sickness dose of eight megs per kg, stayed at 16 weeks. Lastly, we'll discuss some miscellaneous skin drugs, some antifungals. Here's a kitten with ringworm and a person who's about to have ringworm, and antiparasitics. Parasitics. Of the antifungals, lime sulfur appears to be safe, um, even in neonates and other topical antifungals also seem to have a wide safety margin. Um, the azoles, because they require hepatic metabolism and can have an adverse effects, uh, it's probably best to try to limit treatment of dermatophytosis to just topical medications until a puppy or kitten is older than about four months of age. Griseofulvin is contraindicated because it's a known teratogen in cats. And then if we look at the aquacitinib label, we see that it's not labeled for use in dogs less than a year old. And that is because dogs that were treated with uh, Apoquel that were six months old or less, I think that youngest dogs they looked at were six months old, but they were more likely to experience clinically significant immunosuppression and they were prone to things like Demodex and bacterial pneumonia. As mentioned earlier, a lot of parasiticides are marketed for pediatric patients, and pyrantel and fenbendazole have been used safely in neonates um, and pregnant animals. Obviously, there are a lot of other products out there for parasite control and information regarding the minimum age for these can generally be found on the product label or on the Freedom of Information Summary. Here are some resources for drugs that are approved in the U.S., and similar resources generally exist for drugs that are marketed outside the United States, depending on the regulatory body and the, the country in question.